The Grave by Guy de Maupassant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The 17th of July, 1883. At half past two in the morning, the watchman in the cemetery of Bessier, who lived in a small cottage on the edge of his field of the dead, was awakened by the barking of his dog, which was shut up in the kitchen. Going down quickly, he saw the animal sniffing at the crack of the door and barking furiously, as if some tramp had been sneaking about the house. The keeper, Vincent, therefore took his gun and went out. His dog, preceding him at once, ran in the direction of the avenue General Bonnet, stopping short at the monument of Madame Thomasso. The keeper, advancing cautiously, soon saw a faint light on the side of the avenue Malonvert, and stealing in among the graves, he came upon a horrible act of profanation. A man had dug up the coffin of a young woman who had been buried the evening before, and was dragging the corpse out of it. A small dark lantern, standing on a pile of earth, lighted up this hideous scene. Vincent sprang upon the wretch, threw him to the ground, bound his hands, and took him to the police station. It was a young, wealthy, and respected lawyer in town named Kubatai. He was brought into court. The public prosecutor opened the case by referring to the monstrous deeds of the sergeant Bertrand. A wave of indignation swept over the courtroom. When the magistrate sat down, the crowd assembled cried, Death! Death! With difficulty, the presiding judge established silence. Then he said gravely, Defendant, what have you to say in your defense? Kubatai, who had refused counsel, rose. He was a handsome fellow tall, brown, with a frank face, energetic manner, and a fearless eye. Paying no attention to the whistlings in the room, he began to speak in a voice that was low and veiled at first, but that grew more firm as he proceeded. Monsieur le Président, gentlemen of the jury, I have very little to say. The woman whose grave I violated was my sweetheart. I loved her. I loved her not with a sensual love, and not with a mere tenderness of heart and soul, but with an absolute, complete love, with an overpowering passion. Hear me. When I met her for the first time, I felt a strange sensation. It was not astonishment nor admiration, nor yet that which is called love at first sight, but a feeling of delicious well-being as if I had been plunged into a warm bath. Her gestures seduced me, her voice enchanted me, and it was with infinite pleasure that I looked upon her person. It seemed to me as if I had seen her before, and as if I had known her a long time. She had within her something of my spirit. She seemed to me like an answer to a cry uttered by my soul, to that vague and unceasing cry with which we call upon hope during our whole life. When I knew her a little better, the mere thought of seeing her again filled me with exquisite and profound uneasiness. The touch of her hand in mine was more delightful to me than anything that I had imagined. Her smile filled me with a mad joy with the desire to run, to dance, to fling myself upon the ground. So we became lovers. Yes, more than that, she was my very life. I looked for nothing further on earth and had no further desires. I longed for nothing further. One evening, when we had gone on a somewhat long walk by the river, we were overtaken by the rain, and she caught cold. It developed into pneumonia the next day, and a week later she was dead. During the hours of her suffering, astonishment and consternation prevented my understanding and reflecting upon it, but when she was dead I was so overwhelmed by blank despair that I had no thoughts left. I wept. During all the horrible details of the internment my keen and wild grief was like a madness, 
a kind of sensual, physical grief. Then when she was gone, when she was under the earth, my mind at once found itself again, and I passed through a series of moral suffering so terrible that even the love that she had vouchsafed to me was dear at that price. Then the fixed idea came to me. I shall not see her again. When one dwells on this thought for a whole day, one feels as if he were going mad. Just think of it. There is a woman whom you adore, a unique woman, for in the whole universe there is not a second one like her. This woman has given herself to you and has created with you the mysterious union that is called love. Her eye seems to you more vast than space, more charming than the world, that clear eye smiling with her tenderness. This woman loves you. When she speaks to you, her voice floods you with joy. And suddenly she disappears. Think of it. She disappears, not only for you, but for ever. She is dead. Do you understand what that means? Never, 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 not anywhere will she exist any more. Never more will that eye look upon anything again. Never more will that voice, nor any voice like it, utter a word in the same way as she uttered it. Never more will a face be born that is like hers. Never, never. The moulds of statues are kept casts are kept by which one can make objects with the same outlines and forms, but that one body and that one face will never more be born again upon the earth, and yet millions and millions of creatures will be born, and more than that, and this one woman will not reappear among all the women of the future. Is it possible? It drives one mad to think of it. She lived for twenty years, not more, and she has disappeared for ever, for ever, for ever. She thought, she smiled, she loved me, and now nothing. The flies that die in the autumn are as much as we are in this world, and now nothing. And I thought that her body, her fresh body, so warm, so sweet, so white, so lovely, would rot down there in that box under the earth. And her soul, her thought, her love, where is it? Not to see her again. The idea of this decomposing body that I might yet recognize haunted me. I wanted to look at it once more. I went out with a spade, a lantern, and a hammer. I jumped over the cemetery wall and I found the grave, which had not yet been closed entirely. I uncovered the coffin and took up a board. An abominable odor. The stench of putrefaction greeted my nostrils. Oh, her bed perfumed with oris! Yet I opened the coffin, and holding my lighted lantern down into it, I saw her. Her face was blue, swollen, frightful. A black liquid had oozed out of her mouth. She! That was she! Horror seized me. But I stretched out my arm to draw this monstrous face toward me. And then I was caught. All night I have retained the foul odor of this putrid body the odor of my well-beloved as one retains the perfume of a woman after a love embrace. Do with me what you will. A strange silence seemed to oppress the room. They seemed to be waiting for something more. The jury retired to deliberate. When they came back a few minutes later, the accused showed no fear and did not even seem to think. The president announced with the usual formalities that his judges declared him to be not guilty. He did not move, and the room applauded. End of The Grave by Guy de Maupassant Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama